Uh, Abimelech was, as far as we can tell, one of the very early Philistines, and he lived out on the coast. And Abraham moved into this area. He was nomadic, but he would stay in one place for a very long time, and he had huge, huge flocks and herds. He was one of possibly one of the wealthiest men in the world, or at least in this part of the world at that time. We know this because Abraham also had a private army. Some people could have even called Abraham, and I'm really reluctant to call him this, but like a warlord at one point, because he had over 400 mercenaries that he paid along with their families to travel with him. And Abimelech on the coast, remember the Philistines are seagoing people, now you have an inland people up in the mountains up here, and the Israelites are mountain dwellers, or Canaanites rather, mountain dwellers, and you have Hittites overlapping in this area. Remember, Abraham got his, to his tomb from a Hittite. So you have all kinds of different peoples blending in here, but Abimelech needs his back covered. So Abraham has a private army, and it's mobile, and he's in this area. So Abimelech wants to make a treaty with Abraham. But the problem in this area, as Avi pointed out, is water, or the lack thereof. It's hard to come by around here. And so wells were dug. After Abraham died, Abimelech filled up a lot of these wells because whoever owns the water owns the land, basically, and the people on it. They control things. But he needs Abraham. He needs Abraham to watch his back. And so they make a treaty with each other. And then some of the Abraham's men get into a conflict with some of Abimelech's men over water and grazing rights and these sorts of things. And suddenly Abimelech wonders if he can really trust Abraham. Abraham then sends Abimelech seven ewe lambs representing seven different wells and an oath that I own this well it's mine, but I will have your back, and I will protect you. So this area here and this place here became known as Beer, Beer uh, I can't pronounce it quite properly, in the, but Beersheva, which the seven wells, seven ewe lambs representing the wells, but also Beer Saba, which is the other form of Beersheva, which means the well of the oath. And it makes a whole lot of sense when you hear it with that connotation, the well of the oath. Sure, it was the land of the seven wells and the city of the seven wells. In fact, this area was also the land where Hagar was sent out, off in that direction. But it was in the region of Beersheba where she was actually sent out and she found a, a spring that God gave for her. So anyway, this is the well of the oath. And here again, Abraham may have, probably did, dig this well. We're talking going way, way back. You're sitting in a place that's, right now, we're talking about an era of 3,800 years ago. But Beersheba goes back about 6,000 years. This place is incredibly old. So with all that in mind, the well of the oath between two people, here we go, Abraham, who is called by God, and he's going to be the, he's the exalted father, Abram, and then father of many, Abraham. And he's here. God made an oath with him that he's going to be the father of this great nation, the Jewish people, the Hebrews. And over here, you have these idol-worshipping pagans on the coast. And he makes a deal with them right here. I'll protect you. I've got your back. Now, there had been a long standing feud, war, conflict, put the word to it that you want, between Egypt and Israel. In fact, it goes back thousands of years, the conflict between Egypt and this land, the people of Israel. Well, it kind of broke out in its worst way, as you know, in the more recent wars with Israel, as Egypt being part of the uh, the 1973 were the Yom Kippur War, as you know. And uh, the conflict after the 73 war left Egypt in a very precarious position. Of course, the Israeli forces got within just a few miles of Cairo when they were called back because World War III might have just broken out. 
It didn't, but it was about to. And Egypt was now in a position where it had to rebuild, it had to negotiate peace with Israel, and they didn't want to do it. National pride is on the line. Honor, which remember, the people that live in this part of the world, they deal with honor and shame. This is how the life works here. You shame me, I get you back. And Egypt was in a bad spot at that point because Israel had come back from almost annihilation and won this amazing war. God did it. So of all the interesting things that could have happened in the late, um, in the late 70s, Anwar Sadat, the president of Egypt, through an American newscaster, Walter Cronkite, the most trusted man in America, suddenly announces on the air during a live interview, I'm going to Israel and I want to meet with Begin. And this shakes the world. It was a mundane interview until then and suddenly he announces this and, the, and everybody says, what did he just say? And Walter Cronkite, of all people, begins making phone calls and helps set this up. There were a lot of people involved, but it's interesting that he was. And in the process, finally, Sadat goes to Israel. And Begin, Menachem Begin, the prime minister, is his host. And it's quite an occasion. As a matter of fact, it's unprecedented. It's really the first time in history that an Egyptian leader has moved into the land of Israel and actually seen Jerusalem in peace. Not as a conqueror, but as a visitor. It was quite amazing. Well, shortly thereafter, he, uh, Begin is invited to go to Egypt, but it's six months later and it's in the Sinai and they don't, e it's not even in, in an honored position. It's almost an insult is what happens without going into excessive detail here. And it seems like the process is beginning to just deteriorate overnight. President Jimmy Carter, who was not America's greatest president by any stretch, but did the greatest thing of his presidential career, he got on the phone to Sadat and Begin and said, come to Washington. Let's work this out. We have an opportunity. Let's not let it slip through our fingers. They fly to Washington. They go to Camp David, Maryland, where during the process of negotiation, it got so bad that Sadat and his group packed their bags. They were ready to walk out, and there was a breakthrough. And suddenly they could agree on something. And they came up with a document that many of you know because you were alive at the time to see it as was I, something known as the Camp David Accord. Six months later, the men come back and they have a great table set up in front of the White House, Sadat on one side, Begin on the other, Carter in the middle, and they sign this document in triplicate. And the world rejoices absolutely goes nuts. They're nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. People are shouting, Peace Prize, Peace Prize. And then they stand up from the table. They gather together, all three of them, and if you've seen the pictures that were taken, they all but hugged each other, which would have been rather undignified for these important world leaders. But they, they shook hands and each grabbed each other's arm and they pulled themselves in and they're smiling ear to ear. These mortal enemies with this, this American president there who had helped orchestrate this whole arrangement. And the world is saying, peace, peace between Egypt and Israel, an impossible thing. Who would have imagined in any lifetime that this could possibly happen? A few weeks later, something else happened. And it was, as far as I know, never reported in the West. I had to come here to learn about it. And it is on the internet, you can read about it. Avi looked it up. You see, in this spot, at this well, Sadat and Begin met again. Back in 1979, back in May, May 29th, I believe it was. Is that correct? Yes. And they met here. And part of what they did was they, of course, you sign a paper, you're signing a document, you're making an oath, a covenant with another person in modern terms. But in this part of the world, a signature on paper with many of the peoples here mean very little. It's a sign, it's a signature, it's the way we do things now. But the old way of doing things is something we even talked about 
at the garden tomb, something we talked about in the upper room when we were there. That when you break bread with somebody, you tear off the bread and you don't have two pieces of bread, you still have one piece of bread. Remember, it's like dropping a coffee mug on the floor. How many coffee mugs are on the floor when it shatters? Just one, just in a lot of pieces. But when you break bread with somebody, it's not only hospitality, it's peacemaking by the ancient mindset. Jesus, the bread of life, made us not only at peace with God, but made us relatives with God, his kin, his children, bread of life. Take the bread of life from heaven, we belong to God. But you do it with one another, and it's reconciliation. And kings in ancient times would reconcile by eating with each other. They would sit down, they would break bread. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You see. So, here, these two men went here. And in front of the well of their common ancestor, they're the same blood. They diverged a long time ago, but they're the same blood because of that one man, Abraham. And this was his well, and well is life. That they took a piece of bread, one of them, who knows who brought it out, I don't know, I still don't know, and they broke it, and they both ate. <coughs> and even though they're both dead, Sadat by an assassin's bullet, Begin from a broken heart after the passing of his wife, the peace still exists between Egypt and Israel. And it's tense, but strong. Not because two men put a signature to paper and then almost hugged each other out in front of the White House, but because two very brave men had the guts to stand here and break a piece of bread and eat it and declare to the world, we're brothers. We're related. We're brothers under the skin now. Bread that went into you went into me. The bread that went into me went into you. What do you do with that? We have now, we have now ratified our oath with each other. And that happened right here. That's an amazing thing. But it shows you how people reconcile. From kings all the way down to peasants. From God through Jesus to the entire world, whoever takes the bread of life. That is an amazing thing. Well, another thing about this place, and I'm going to be much briefer now, is that you were all the way up in the north visiting a very, very well-watered place called <coughs> Tel Dan. Well, you have now gone from Dan to Beersheba. That's in the Bible. The extent of historic Israel it actually went much further at times, but Basically, it was from Dan to Beersheba. Those were where the tribal allotments are. And when you hear that mentioned in the Bible, they're talking about the full extent of the nation. Now you're in Beersheba here. And there's one last thing I wanted to mention. You know, if you look down this wadi here, this ravine, you'll see a Bedouin camp down there. And as you look in the Bedouin camp, down in the, uh, towards the Bedouin camp to the right of it, You'll see some animals out there grazing away. And right out in the middle of some of those animals, you'll see a person walking. Maybe two or three. My eyes aren't quite that good anymore, but can you see the people down there by the animals? Let me ask you a question. Who are they? What do they do? The answer is, well, I assume that they're herdsmen, shepherds, whatever they might be. They're Bedouins. But do you know them? Do you know their names? I don't. I don't know who they are. They're just little specks on the horizon. The most colossal figure in human history, I'm not talking about God's history, I'm talking about human history, is actually not Jesus. He's the most important person that ever entered this world, for sure, with no close second. But the most important historical person in the world to date is Abraham, because more people in this world know of him than anybody else who has ever lived in history. He had that great of effect on people. He is the father of the Jews. He is the father of the Christians. He is the father of the Muslims. All of this combined, they all recognize him somehow as the origin 
Everybody knows him. That one man was no bigger than one of those people. Might have been wealthier, might have been more renowned because he, he had the wealth, he had the army, he had the influence. But he was no bigger than one of those people. And at a distance, you wouldn't know him from anybody else. You wouldn't recognize him from anyone else. What can God do through one normal human being? Especially a guy like him who tended to mess things up like everybody else. He did a lot of things that were kind of, well, man, he shouldn't have done that, Abraham. He did it anyway. <coughs> like us. Well, we've done so many goofy things, wrong things, my past, my, my home, whatever it might be. What can God do with one person? When we started this tour, we talked about why the Holy Land was called the Holy Land. And it's not because the land is holy, even though it does belong to God. There's no question about that. He made the covenant. This is his land. But this land is soaked in blood up to your neck. It's holy because of the people who were here. Because Jesus was here. Because Abraham was here. In, now, Jesus was perfect. But everybody else, they weren't. But they were still saints, remember? Holy ones. God's holy ones. And right where we started, I'll say it again. Only God can say, if you're not the next Apostle Paul, or Mother Teresa, or Joanna, or Mary Magdalene, or Peter, or Stephen, or anybody else. And we're still talking about them. And we still know their names, though we wouldn't know their faces any more than looking out there at a distance. One little tiny speck on the horizon. What effect could they possibly have on the world? What effect could you possibly have on the world? That's Abraham out there. And you're sitting right here. What's he going to do with you? I just wanted you to know these things. This is a great spot to talk about just that.